So I'll um, introduce the next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Matt Helmus of Temple University. And then um, I believe Matt, you'll, you'll be introducing uh, other people uh, within your group and then also uh, Chris Jones. All right, so you're uh, yeah. whenever, whenever you're set, Matt. Great, I'll start sharing my screen now, Greg. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm just gonna introduce uh, this next session. Um, and I wanna reiterate three take home messages that I've talked about in the past about predictive modeling, as you see the next four talks on predictive modeling. So first, what we're gonna be talking to you about is predictive modeling of spotted lanternfly population dynamics. And so here we're thinking about modeling the growth or forecasting the growth and also forecasting dispersal. And so predictive modeling is forecasting. And so just like any forecast that you're thinking about in terms of weather, uh, they are not perfect. If we think about weather forecasting, it's one of the most sophisticated forecasting technologies that we've ever developed, but it, even a 10-day weather forecast is only right about half the time. We have all these satellites with these sophisticated climatic models, and we still can't predict long-term weather forecasts. Our long-term weather forecasts are incredibly coarse. This is just the weather forecast from NOAA. It's incredibly sophisticated, but you can see how coarse it is just for this winter, these winter temperatures. Why is that? And that's because nature itself is a complex process. It's a complex system. So I use the term complexity uh, in its scientific sense. And inherently, predictive modeling is complexity science. So complexity is, arises in any system in which many different agents interact, they adapt to each other and their environments. And so these types of complex systems are very difficult to forecast with high accuracy. And so the models that you're going to be seeing, we are all doing our best to try and forecast things, but you really can't take them as the truth of what's going to happen in the future. You can only take them as risk. This invasion is a really complex system. There's a lots of different agents in the, in the system. Spotted lanternfly are agents. The humans are agents. The plant hosts, how they're adapting, et cetera. All of, the, all of these different uh, agents are interacting in very complex ways. And so the first take home message that I want you to um, make sure and think about as you're seeing these next four uh, very sophisticated talks is that predictive models of spotted lanternfly population dynamics can only tell you about risk. They're not gonna tell you what will absolutely happen in the future. And so finds like what we currently observed in Indiana in, in 2021, they're just not forecastable, but they're very expected. We expect people like what happened in Indiana to move their belongings, to move their families to different parts of the country and accidentally spread spotted lanternfly. So these are expected long distance dispersal events, but they are incredibly complex to forecast. And so use these models, use the applications that we've developed to survey areas of high risk, but also buffer your state from the expected and unforecastable introductions, like what happened in Indiana. How do you do that? Perform outreach early and at statewide scales. That's increasingly what many of you are all doing. Even if you're um, uh, not doing that now, uh, start to do that now, because many people looking and knowing about spotted land fly are much more likely to identify these very rare and unforecastable introductions. If you see spotted land fly during a survey, immediately treat that location. Don't come back or wait a bit treat that location right away because these spotted lanternfly move a lot. There are lots of agents that are moving around. You might not find them again. And then increasingly, as we see the research, reducing tree of heaven does reduce spotted lanternfly establishment risk. They grow really quickly on tree of heaven, especially when there's a mixed diet with say wild grape or some of these other species. And finally, predictive modeling needs many different models to increase accuracy and precision. You combine many models to make better forecasts, Every model makes different assumptions and combining those multiple models finds the best and most robust predictions. So the final take home message, compare multiple models and applications when designing your response to the spotted lanternfly invasion. And so now I'm gonna pass it off and we're gonna talk about four different predictive models. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Chris from NC State and then uh, three postdocs that are working in, in my group at Temple University. And we'll address any questions at the end of the presentations. Okay, Chris, take it away. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, y'all. I'm Chris Jones, a research professor at NC State Center for Geospatial Analytics. 
And today I'm talking about work on iterative forecasting, improving model accuracy for spotted lanternfly forecasts. I want to quickly thank my colleagues for the amazing work they've done on the research that I'm presenting today. So this map of this is a map of forecasted spotted lantern fly spread to 2050 based on, 29, based on starting in 2019 detection data. This is a county level aggregate of mean probability of detecting spotted lantern fly at a given point in time. I showed a similar map last year based on our model at the time. Today I'll be giving updates to that model and discussing model improvements we have made over the past year. Specifically, this model now includes a network kernel that better captures long distance dispersal of spotted lantern fly. So we break our forecasting platform into four iterative loops that all work together to improve model performance and applicability for decision makers and other stakeholders. The first is the calibration loop where the model improves as we integrate new data. The second is the scenario modeling loop and the fourth is the participatory feedback loop. And those two work together to help us better understand the needs of decision makers and stakeholders using model and out outputs and our decision support system. And we're currently working with multiple states to help improve these models, outputs, and decision support systems. So if you want, contact me after the talk. The third loop is the field observation and scientific feedback loop. And this is where the new data on species location is collected and new field studies are performed to help improve our understanding of the spotted lantern flies biology and how we apply this as updates to the model to test hypotheses at large spatial scales. I will be going into details about how we have done this in the context of spotted lantern fly for the rest of this talk. But first, let's talk a little bit about the model. So now I'm going to I'm going to show a video illustrating how the simulation works through space and time. We use environmental drivers and current detections coupled with statistically derived parameters to forecast spread into the future across space and time. The red circles show the number of spotted lantern fly dispersing from a cell. The model then determines where they disperse to, and they can either establish or not, depending on environmental conditions where they arrive. So, and we repeat this process for multiple time steps. So here we're showing a second time step. And again, the red circles indicate where spotted lantern fly, the number of spotted lantern fly that are dispersing from that location based on the simulation, and they can either establish or not, and they can increase in the current cell as well. I don't mean to, I don't mean to interrupt, yeah. but we just had one request. If you could talk a little louder, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, that yeah. sounds good to me. Yeah. All right. And so we sped that up, and that is a forecast across both space and time. And so the first major change to our model from last year is that we've incorporated rail transport as a driver of long distance dispersal. So let's talk about the model as it was previously, and then we'll discuss the network model. So our model driving our spotted lantern flight forecast is a dynamic spatial temporal model of, of spotted lantern fly spread and works by statistically calibrating and updating parameters for beta, alpha one, alpha two, and gamma as new data becomes available using the calibration loop discussed earlier. We use a combination of accuracy, precision, recall, and specificity to fit model parameters. In both cases, here I'm showing the old model structure with the random long distance kernel with the alpha two as the uh, parameter for a Cauchy distribution. And we've updated that to account for rel networks now. And what happens is that alpha two parameter is replaced with a network kernel that takes in the minimum and maximum distance that a spotted lantern fly could travel along a rail. And these parameters are again fit based on data collected from the field, so those field surveys. And the second change to the model is that, that of the influence of temperature. When we first started modeling spotted lanternfly, the only data on the effect of temperature on spotted lanternfly reproduction and survival were from small correlative studies out of Korea. And that is the data that we used in the model. So that's this reclassification here. But in 2020, Kretman et al. published SLF survival based on temperature tolerances. We used their study to update the temperature driver data for our survival and reproduction, for survival and reproduction in our model. 
This allows us to have a comparison of how integrating that new information with our best set of parameters affects our forecast accuracy. I will show how all of the models compare once I discuss the third change to the model. So the next change is we added, Nick, talk about uh, adding new features based on observation. So during field surveys, survey teams have observed that when spotted lanternfly densities in the area become large, spotted lanternflies tend to disperse longer distances and large numbers. In order to model this, we added a feature to the model that simulates spotted lanternflies leaving if their numbers were above 70% of the carrying capacity of the cell. We simulated that around 50, 50 to 80% of spotted lanternflies in that cell would disperse three times our calibrated natural dispersal distance. One thing to note with these numbers is that they're not based, measured in the field or calibrated for the best fit of the data. They were based on best uh, assumptions that for those particular parameters. The next step is to calibrate these and hopefully get some measurements from the field to that back up those calibrated numbers. So with that, I'll jump into model performance. So we ran the model with all combinations of those three different uh, changes to the model. So we ran it with the old Couchy kernel, with the overpopulation model, with the new temperature data, and with both the new temperature and uh, overpopulation model. And what was interesting is that the network kernel with the new weather performed by far the best, but both the network kernel and the uh, new weather data both increased the model by about 7% in terms of accuracy alone. But when you put them together, they increased it by 12% compared to our previous model. And the overpopulation model seemed to not make much of a difference, but did seem to lower the um, variation in our models. So we have here is the mean and standard deviation for all of these metrics across 1,000 different runs. So we did took the mean across all the runs and the standard deviation across all the runs to see how much it varied in terms of performance based on these changes to the model. So one thing I think we can do and hopefully do better is to calibrate these overpopulation or this kind of uh, density dependent dispersal piece to better fit the data. So, and then one last thing I wanna talk about is we have a forecasting platform that allows stakeholders to go in and test different management scenarios. Here I'm showing a video of the web-based dashboard that we've developed to allow users to interact with this model and data. So we aggregate detections to a spatial grain of one kilometer in this case for field and simulated data. The user can also select from a number of additional layers for display that provide context for management such as hosts, railroads, et cetera. And then the user could also select two different management types, either host removal. So in this case, that's removal of tree of heaven or different pesticides to apply to treat tree of heaven. And they can use multiple methods to place that treatment spatially and I'll speed this video up a little bit because I think I'm running close to the 10 minute time. So you can look at, oh, I did not speed it up. So, and then you can see how the treatments affected the spread of spotted lantern fly in terms of affected total detected area simulated by the model. And with that, I will take questions, or I guess not questions, we will take questions after all the talks. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Stephanie Lefkevich, and I am going to be giving the second talk today. Thank you so much, Chris, for your very interesting talk. And... 
Okay, thank you everyone so much for being here at the summit today and at our forecasting and modeling session. I'm going to talk to you about computing the temperature dependent reproductive number of the spotted lanternfly. This is joint work with Seba Debona, who's going to speak in a little while, as well as Matthew Helmus and Benjamin Seibold. We are all at Temple together in the math and biology departments. So what is the biological question we're trying to answer today? If a group of spotted lanternflies arrives in a location, will the climate in that location support year-to-year -year population growth? And we are approaching this question with a mathematical model. So through our modeling work, we predict the population dynamical behavior that arises from the interplay between climatic conditions and the biology of the species. Concretely, we model temperature, we model development fecundity and mortality rates, and we model diapause. And from this, we compute explicit population counts over time. And we're really going to focus in particular on the diapause process. We know that SLF diapause as eggs, so of course it's an important feature for the model, but we want to consider the possibility that at some point, some will evolve to not go through diapause. So we want to also you, you know, look at a non-diapause assumption as well and contrast them. So we also ask how do diapause versus non-diapause population dynamics differ in these different climates? This notion of year-to-year -year reproductive number from the previous slide, or sorry, year-to-year -year population growth from the previous slide is quantified by the reproductive number. Here, R0 is defined to be the number of SLF present in year n plus one divided by the number present in year n. Said otherwise, the number of SLF present in a subsequent year per SLF present exactly one year prior. From this definition, we see that R0 is a natural binary measure of establishment potential. If it's less than one, the population declines. If it's equal to one, we're at equilibrium. And if it's greater than one, we see population growth. And the thing I really want to stress here is that R0 depends on climate. So we're not computing one number that works for the, the species anywhere in the world we're really looking at how it changes in different climates and really thinking of it as a function of climate. Let's unpack this a bit more. Many climatic variables affect R0, like temperature, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, but we are going to focus exclusively on temperature here. And in our model, we model the annual temperature profile in a given location with a sinusoidal function. So here on the left is the explicit function, and it's temperature capital T at time little t. And on the right is a graph of this function over the course of a year, and we see that it is very much defined by the two parameters, h, which is the annual mean, and g, which is the annual amplitude. And what we're going to compute today is R0 as a function of H and G. So at this point, you might look at this and say, well, this is an overly simplified model of temperature, right? You don't have diurnal variation. There's no stochasticity that you see in real temperature data. And that's true. But this type of formulation is really an excellent way to study the sensitivity of R0 to those two parameters, annual mean and amplitude that are so crucial to characterizing the temperature in a given location without the, the effects of stochasticity that might you know, create a bit of noise in that analysis. In terms of the actual model that we're using, it's called a stage age structured PDE or partial differential equation. I'm not going to go through what this is for the sake of time, but here's a schematic diagram of the general framework. We split the full lanternfly population up into four groups, three sessile stages on the left, and then all motiles together on the right. And we make this division on the basis that individuals in each of these groups experience temperature in about the same way, according to our model. And then for each of the four groups, we derive a collection of functions that represent the rates at which underlying population dynamical processes occur. For example, for the motiles, if we have a function lambda that depends on temperature and is the development rate, we have an analogous function m, which is the mortality rate, and another function k, which is the egg laying rate. And in this depiction that you see here, of course, we're looking at the diapause model. Under the diapause model assumptions, eggs that are laid in the winter and spring are assumed to not go through diapause, and they go up here. Whereas those laid in the summer and fall are assumed to go through diapause before they start developing. And when we transition instead to a non-diapause model, we simply eliminate this lower branch and all eggs laid at any time of year go into this non-diapause basket. 
Now let's look at heat maps of R0. First in the diapause case, so here's a plot of R0 as a function of the annual mean H and the annual amplitude G on the X and Y axes. And note that the range of values it assumes goes from zero to about 21, which is you know, roughly the maximum you get in the lower right corner here. So this white curve that you see is the level curve on which R0 is equal to one. If you are interior to the curve, R0 is greater than one and you have growth. Whereas if you're anywhere in the outside, R0 is less than one and the population will decline. Right now, of course, this is just an abstract temperature parameter domain and it's not linked to any real temperature data, but we can approximate the R0 in any location in the world we want by simply finding the values of H and G that best approximate the real temperature profile in that location. So for instance, New York, falls about here, right? A moderate mean, moderate amplitude. Whereas Los Angeles would fall down here because it has a much higher mean temperature and less variance, so a lower amplitude. And here's a sampling of some more locations across the United States. And in fact, the interior of this dotted curve is in a sense a plot of the US, but not a geographic map. It is the subset of this temperature parameter domain that roughly corresponds to US temperatures. Now, if we look on the right in the high mean area, we see Florida, Texas, California, Arizona, areas that have pretty high establishment potential. And if we look in the moderate mean area, we get some agricultural regions like Napa Valley, Nashville, Wichita, metro areas like New York and Chicago that also have establishment potential. But when we get into sufficiently low means, we have the Rocky Mountain areas, the northern Midwest, and even Seattle, where basically no establishment potential is predicted. Now, in contrast, let's look at the same exact picture, but for the non-diapause model. For ease of comparison with the diapause picture on the left, these are plotted on the same linear scale from 0 to 21. But instead of thinking of this very warm yellow color as representing a, a maximum R0 of 21, it's really all the r naughts that are greater than or equal to 21. And in fact, in this lower right corner where we have a lot of yellow, the reproductive number in this area is between one and two, sorry, one and three orders of magnitude larger than it was in the diapause case. And the reason for this is that in these very warm climates, the populations can experience multivoltanism due to the fact that they are unencumbered by the developmental delays of the diapause process. However, we do see the diapause trade-off when we look at the centers of this parameter domain. If we look back on the left in the diapause model, Nashville, Wichita, Chicago, New York, we're all in the growth region. And now when we go over to the right and look at the non-diapause case, they're in the decline region. Finally, let's look at some geographic maps of R0 across the United States. On the left, we have the diapause model and on the right, the non-diapause model. And the blue areas are areas of decline and the red areas are areas of growth. And these maps are from our SLF dashboard. So you can find this by going to the Temple iEcolab webpage, resources, SLF dashboard. And this one is called the growth rate forecast. And so from the, these two pictures, as well as the heat maps on the previous slide, there are a couple of core messages that emerge. Right, from this picture, it's clear that diapause allows the population to move further north. And it does support growth in several agricultural regions and major metropolitan areas. But when non-diapause populations can establish, they tend to have much higher growth rates due to the multivoltanism that uh, diapause populations don't get to experience. Okay, so finally, uh, the next steps for us Something that we're working on is systematic refinement of this temperature model to incorporate some of those important features I mentioned earlier, like diurnal variation, anomalies, and stochasticity. And a really big project we have going forward is the design of control strategies. So we're adding control actions to our model and using a really nice mathematical theory to compute best implementations of these control actions. With that, I will say thank you very much for your attention, and thank you to the USDA and PDA, as well as Temple and the iEco Lab. If anyone wants to talk more or has any more questions, feel free to contact me at my email address in the lower right. And now I am going to pass it off to Nadej, who is going to talk to you about spread modeling.
Thank you, Stephanie. Let me share my screen here. Hi, everyone. I am Nadej Birwa. I am a postdoc at uh, India Ecolab at Temple University. And after Stephanie talked about where uh, spotted lanternfly population could persist, I'm going to talk about where spotted lanternfly populations can spread through germ dispersal. So this requires a little explanation about what exactly germ dispersal is. Okay, so when a species is introduced in a new area, it will first uh, spread through uh, in a continuous way that is called the diffusive spread. But at the same time, populations can establish far away from this core invasion um, in a process that is called germ dispersal that is due to human assisted dispersal. The problem is these populations can spread on their own too through diffusive spread. So this is a real concern even for areas that are far away from the initial invasion. The questions that we need to address for diffusive spread and germ dispersal are a little bit different. When we talk about diffusive spread, the questions are more how fast the spread is going to happen uh, and what are the limits of the spread, while for germ dispersal, it's much more unpredictable. So the questions are more related to where is it going to happen? So we're going to address these questions in three parts. First, we need to find these germ locations. And this is not as easy as it sounds. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Once we know where they are, we need to find what locations they are close to, like what landscape features or infrastructure they are related to. And once we know that, then we can predict where future germs are likely to happen. So here is a map of established spotted lanternfly populations as of 2020. And as you can see, some points are easy to identify as gems, like the point near this black arrow. But some other points are a little bit harder to determine. So it's not only being away from any other point, it's also being away from the diffusive, the, the, the core area, like this red arrow. If we look at this uh, other red arrow here, what probably happened is that there was an initial jump location and then there was a secondary diffusion around it. So it means that we need to um, use the data set of positive surveys from the previous years to see what point was the first one and what is the secondary diffusion around it. Now, if we look at this other red arrow here, this couple of points, um, we need, to, so it seems to be a jump because there is a gap between these points and the, the diffusive spread. But we need to make sure that there are negative sur surveys that were found in between them, because otherwise it could just be an artifact and not a real jump. So our method for that, for that um, consists in starting from the introduction point, picking a year and a direction because the invasion front is heterogeneous, find the, the invasion front, so the, the limit of the diffusive spread, uh, looking in the gap between the diffusive spread and the first jump to find negative surveys to be sure that there are real jump and jumps and list all these jumps. Then we need to repeat all these steps for all the directions and we validate these jumps with rotations of, the, of this direction because once again the in invasion front is heterogeneous. Then we did again to repeat these steps for all the years that we have in our data set and we remove points that are um, close to jumps from previous years to, uh, to avoid um, counting um, secondary diffusions again. So it gets a little bit complicated, but we developed uh, an algorithm that does all of that automatically in just under 40 seconds. And we're going to publish this algorithm along with our publication on jump dispersal. So in terms of results, here is a map of all the jumps that the algorithm found. Uh, so there are 139 jumps. Um, and here on the map, they are colored by year of discovery. You can see that there are clusters of points, clusters of jumps. Um, and here we have two hypotheses. Uh, the first one is that the spotted on flight jumped multiple times to this location the same year. But the alternative hypothesis is that they jump and just spread the same year or uh, a year, even a year before, before they were discovered. So in total, we've got 42 distinct locations here and they include 15 clusters of points. When we look at these 42 locations, what we can see is that the number of new jumps per year increases every year. So jump dispersal is really a concern here. More and more locations uh, are subject to jump dispersal. 
But what's also interesting is that the distance between the invasion front and these jump locations doesn't increase over time. And this is going to be really useful to predict future jumps. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, in the third part. So now that we know what uh, the number of jumps that we have, we need to find um, where they are, where are they located regarding like relative to other infrastructures. So here are the median distances between jump locations and railroads and roads um, and distribution centers and um, popular destinations. Um, and we can see that railroads and roads are located less than 400 meters from all the jump locations. Our jump locations are situated less than 400 meters from railroads and roads. And jump locations are uh, a little bit more than two kilometers away from um, distribution centers and popular destinations. But what is the significance of that? We need to compare these values to something else to see how significant they are. So we calculated a risk estimate based on how, how, how close uh, jump locations are from different property types compared to a null distribution of random points. Um, so the higher the risk estimate, the higher the risk of jump dispersal in, in this particular property type. And here in this table, you can see all the property types that are significantly linked to jump locations. So you can see that there, there's, uh, there are big difference between the different property types. Our railroad are the, are, have a risk estimate of 9.9 .9 compared to primary airports that have a, a risk estimate of 3.5. And this should um, be reflected in the survey priority of these different property types. So you can find this table in the high risk properties app on the SLF dashboard. Um, and you might have noticed that two of these property type are, are, types are different from the others. So there are major roads and railroads here. And because the, the biological hypothesis is a, little bit, is a little bit different for these two, because there is a more mechanistic um, uh, point here, like it can be really more related to house, but it doesn't have fly are transported. We are going to look a little bit closer at these two. And we are going to compare jump locations to diffuse spread locations and uninvaded locations. Um, so when we look at the distance between these three categories to railroads and roads, what we can see, and we, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the graph so you can see it better, is that jump locations are much closer to major roads than diffuse spread and uninvaded locations. And for railroads, both jump locations and diffuse spread are locations are closer to railroads compared to uninvaded locations. But it's even more the case for jump locations compared to diffusive spread locations. So both major roads and railroads are really uh, important in the, in the location of these jump dispersal events. Now that we have all this data about past jumps, we can just transpose it around all the infrastructures uh, to predict high risk locations uh, in the form of risk buffer, as you can see on the image on the right here that shows um, the, the risk buffer around distribution centers in Pennsylvania. And what's really interesting here is that we can intersect risk buffers from different uh, infrastructures type. For example, if you remember for the from the table I showed before, um, the top two property types were railroads and mail carriers, uh, mail carrier infrastructures. And we can take the intersect of these two to even further reduce the, the really high risk location buffer. Um, and we can also reduce it because uh, at the beginning I said that the distance between the invasion front and the, and the jump location is stable over time. So we can also reduce the spatial extent of the risk buffer uh, in this, in this um, area. So this will be all available really soon in the, uh, in the jump app that will be on the SLF dashboard. And um, the, this risk buffer can be used to prioritize survey efforts at location at high risk of uh, jump dispersal to promote the early detection of um, spotted lentil flight population that is crucial to their control. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm going to pass it on to Seba. Thank you, Nadesh. Let me just share my screen. Here we go. Can you all see um, the presentation? 
Yes, yeah, it looks good. Thanks, Eva. Great, thank you. Um, so hi, everyone, um, and thank you uh, for joining today's summit. Uh, also, thank you uh, to the organizers for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk uh, today. My name is Seba Debona. I'm a postdoc uh, at the IECO lab at Temple. Uh, and today, what I want to do is to try and give a bit of a bird's eye view uh, on what we've done with regards to SLS at the IECO lab. Maybe try and draw some conclusions and, and hopefully some lessons learned um, um, that we can derive from having to work with this pest species. Uh, and the way I want to do this is by presenting a, a framework to document and forecast uh, the spread of uh, these species uh, using a data science uh, approach that can integrate field efforts uh, to monitor and, uh, and control uh, the SLF. Um, so I wanted to start with a bit of a schematics of, of what this process might look like. Um, so we all know after SLF, SLF was discovered in uh, Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture first, followed by several other uh, state and federal agencies started running field surveys uh, to collect data on SLF occurrence. Uh, and whenever data is collected um, uh, by several agencies, which use different techniques and, and perhaps protocols, uh, the data might look very different from one another. So it's important to uh, introduce a step where we harmonize this data uh, before aggregating it. And by doing so, we can obtain a much fuller picture of the current state of the envision instead of sort of having uh, sparse information here and there about um, where this species is. In addition to this, by definition, uh, regardless of how uh, extensive uh, and great the field surveys have, have been, they cannot be exhaustive. Uh, so we still might want to fill spatial gaps uh, by interpolating data uh, and obtain uh, occurrence likelihood uh, of SLF in non-surveyed sites. And of course, we can also take the same approach from a temporal point of view and try to fill the temporal uh, gap in our knowledge by forecasting how the future spread will, will look like uh, using both statistical and uh, mathematical modeling techniques that um, some of which you've seen already uh, in, the, in the past few minutes. Um, and finally, this knowledge needs to be communicated to stakeholders and to the public. This is crucial. Um, not just to sort of uh, bring back this knowledge to others, but also because uh, it can help guide uh, control efforts to be more effective and also inform future surveys. And this creates a, an integrated iterative feedback loop uh, where this data science framework can, can keep feeding new information uh, onto uh, the field uh, operations, uh, which then will collect new data, which can be included um, again into this, into this framework. And so by now you will have realized that this, uh, this framework is sort of divided into two main aspects. One is the field effort one, and the other one, the one I'll focus uh, the most on uh, today is this data science framework uh, that we at DIA Collab have been working on for a few years now. As I mentioned before, uh, sort of step one is to try and put together all this, this uh, enormous amount of data that has been collected. Um, and again, because it is collected by several sources, it is uh, going to be heterogeneous, which means this data needs to be passed through a, a thorough review uh, after it's received. Um, it needs to, be, needs to be stored, but also uh, tidied and checked for any potential errors. Um, after that, all the variables collected um, in the various data sets need to be harmonized, which means uh, they need to be in the same format and they need to be able to be um, merged between different data files. And once we've done this, then we can uh, aggregate the data together and export it for, for further use. Uh, the core of this data set looks a little bit like uh, this. Um, so it will contain spatial, uh, inf spatial information uh, in terms of the uh, geospatial coordinates, uh, also information on the date um, the survey was conducted. Uh, of course, uh, information on the source. So who conducted the survey? And then finally, some informations uh, on uh, the biology of the species. So in this case, for example, whether SLF was present just in terms of uh, a few dead individuals, uh, so a regulatory incident type uh, survey, or uh, whether this um, survey was documented in established population. And if that was the case, what population density was in a given location. This is again, just a core. There's a lot of other information that can be extrapolated from these data sets, of course. This is sort of a nugget, of, uh, uh, a uh, very uh, minimal unit that we can use to move forward. And of course, we can take a look at this uh, from a, a spatial point of view as well. 
This is a map of, um, as of 2021, uh, the locations where SLF um, established populations have been found. You can see them here colored um, by the year they were first discovered. Um, and then in gray, you, the gray crosses represent um, negative surveys. So places where we, we know spotted lanternfly is currently uh, absent or is not present with established populations. Um, we can also take a look at um, the sort of share of data provided by the different sources. And what I want to draw your attention here um, on is that the uh, portion of this data where there's overlap, where multiple sources provide data on the same location is relatively small. There's actually a lot of data that is non-redundant where different agencies are surveying areas that are different from one another, which again, highlights the uh, importance to put uh, different sources of data together to have a much clearer picture. Moving on to try and fill the spatial gaps. Once again, as I mentioned before, uh, you can be as extensive as, uh, as you want, but you cannot uh, fully cover the landscape. This is just because of the economy of effort, it's impossible to uh, invest money and resources into uh, looking at every inch of landscape. So how can we take care of that? Um, for example, uh, if we zoom in here and we take a look at an area that um, has points around it being surveyed, but not that specific area, having any survey, how, do we, um, how can we estimate the likelihood of SLF being present there without uh, jumping in, in, a, in a car and, and going to survey it itself? Well, one way we can do that is by using um, inference techniques like um, um, inverse system weighing, uh, where we can estimate the probability for each year of SLF being present uh, in a site that has not been surveyed uh, based on uh, surveyed sites around it. And if we do that, um, what we obtain is a map that will look a little bit like this, where we have the likelihood of presence of SLF uh, going from zero, meaning SLF is absent, uh, to one, meaning SLF is um, almost certainly present according to the model. And of course, you can see there's a, a very nice constellation of points uh, in Pennsylvania, which is one of the, the uh, most heavily surveyed areas. Um, and then we have sort of this um, odd blurs uh, in areas where we have some information on SLF presence, but not much around it. And so how do we deal with this? Um, what we can do is we can come up with a trust metric that will give us an information on information on how much we can rely on this interpolated data. Uh, and this is based on uh, how many surveys are within a certain area of a given point. So here, for example, we can see that uh, areas that we put a lot of trust in, uh, meaning areas that have been heavily surveyed um, are in the lighter color, whereas area where very few surveys have occurred are in this uh, purple, darker, darker color. And we can put this together with the previous um, image to try and uh, limit our um, interpolation to areas where we have at least some degree of confidence. And of course, we can do this with various levels of, of stringency. We can reduce the area um, around a given point that we want to consider and also increase the amount of points that we want to have to be calling a given data point uh, reliable. Um, if now we want to uh, think about um, uh, bridging the temporal gap and so looking into the, the future, uh, as the talks from Chris and Stephanie have um, highlighted, developing an accurate forecasting model takes a lot of time, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of effort. Um, and, and so in the short term, is there something that we can do uh, to, uh, to provide those forecasting information um, sort of readily? And something we can do is we can resort to more general modeling frameworks um, like statistical uh, modeling that require a lot less extensive knowledge on the specific um, um, biology of the species. Um, to help us with this, uh, Emma Hudgens uh, at Carleton has developed a generalized dispersal kernel model to forecast uh, the spread of forest pest species. This model uses general knowledge on other species to predict behavior of a, a novel pest species. And we have applied this to, um, um, to USLF. Uh, there'll be a publication out uh, soon. Uh, so I won't um, talk too much about this, but what we're doing is we're using data from the present and past uh, spread to, to forecast will be the, the potential uh, future. And again, this is a much less sophisticated approach, but as Matt was suggesting at the beginning, having multiple uh, modeling uh, frameworks and approaches that are applied and being able to compare them with one another really helps uh, to get a, a more complete idea.
And then finally, um, once again, effective communication needs to occur on a shared platform that is easily accessible to the stakeholders and the public, and also that can be easily updated. Uh, and the way we've done that is uh, by um, managing a dashboard. You can find at this address. This contains resources that um, uh, and also interactive applications uh, that are regularly uh, updated with the latest versions of the uh, of the data that you um, just saw me talk about. Um, this is how uh, our dashboard looks like, and you'll find different tabs that sort of point to different things. Uh, some of the apps there are uh, have been developed and are maintained by us um, at the Ico Lab, and other, of course, point to some of the uh, great resources that have been developed by by others. Um, before um, going, I sort of want to try and, and and sum up and recap, bringing back this this idea of this framework, which seems to be uh, sort of like a good working system to to collaborate between uh, data science uh, and and field um, operations. Um, and the reason why I want to bring this back is that this type of framework should not be limited to studying SLF. We've learned from SLF how we should be uh, rapidly developing this type of framework. Now we can apply it to the next uh, test of concern uh, with very little changes to, uh, to this framework. And this is due to its generality and will also help with providing a, a, a rapid response uh, to a new discovery. Um, so in terms of learning from SLF, uh, we are in the process of packaging this framework now, which will be published uh, as both a paper and a coding framework uh, that will be distributed to both researchers and, and stakeholders. And this will include tutorials uh, describing how this analysis can be reproduced and also adapted to, uh, to a specific species. Um, and with this, I wanna thank you for listening. And of course, um, all my um, lab members uh, and um, collaborators and people have contributed with the data. And I believe now we'll uh, take any questions that you might have either on this presentation or, or any of the uh, previous ones you've heard in this session. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Matt, did you have anything you were gonna do as a, as a um, call up, as a wrap up or anything? No, there's there's been some pretty good questions um, in the chat. That right. I think um, as a team, you know, uh, Chris, and I, Stephanie, if, if you were all still here, if, if we can address, because um, uh, we do have time to do that. So a first question was brought up um, by Julie Gould, and uh, she asks, we find that spotted landfly eggs require a chill before the nymphs will hatch. Is there any evidence in the field of non-diapausing eggs? And certainly other people on the, on the panel, um, please unmute yourself and, and address this question. I can maybe jump in here uh, with a with a quick observation. I think I, I was scrolling through the the chat and I saw that uh, someone already had pointed to Kelly Hoover's uh, data on uh, in the lab. That is, um, I know that she has um, looked at eggs developing in lab conditions without chilling. So we know that's a possibility. There are also studies from um, from Korea, and now I am blanking on the uh, on the specific paper where. Eggs have been collected throughout the season since the uh, the first egg laying, and some of the eggs that are taken from the field right after uh, being um, laid can develop readily. It's a very small proportion of those eggs, um, but but it is a possibility that eggs actually do not require chilling to uh, terminate diapause, and those eggs uh, uh, likely will not need to go through diapause. Yeah, and this this is Greg Matt. The only thing we just had like it was one year we had reports but you know nobody collected any specimens but it was like late into the fall and it was warm that one fall um you know in areas of where uh SLF is present um and so the only thing we could think of is maybe it was like in like one of the very first egg masses that was laid but uh yeah there were reports of people uh observing like surveyors of uh some nymphs here and there but you know we weren't mm -hmm. concerned because of course we we're going down into like the winter temperatures and they wouldn't survive or complete development or anything but yeah that was just kind of unusual but then but it was like again it was just like this anecdotal and like it was very rare event but yeah there, there was some discussion about that like whether that um you know definitely like an egg mass uh had hatched from the fall uh you know without going through diapause but again it had been really warm so you just take that information, but you know I haven't heard any reports like that again. It, uh, Julie, uh, sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, 
Sorry, I just realized you were talking, so sorry. How about that? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Great, go ahead. Woohoo! <laughs> I had to <laughs> select the right thing. Um, good thing I did that before my talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things we found with emerald ash borer is if you collected insects in the fall, they would eventually ha uh, become adults. Uh, but it would take forever. And then the, the longer into the season you collected them, even without chill, they would just take, they would take longer. And then as you collected them towards the spring, they would take a shorter and shorter amount. The upshot was they all emerged at the same time anyway. Even though some of them didn't require chill per se, they were still in diapause and and chill would break it or time would break it, but they really were still in diapause. So, you know, whether they need chill or not, but, you know, the, the upshot is, you know, we're, we're concerned that they might have two generations per year. And that's, that's been a concern with gypsy moth as well, but I don't think it's ever come to fruition that they, you know, even though they did see some that didn't require a chill, I think it never, it never became a problem in the field. So just some observations. Yeah, and we, we never, uh, like we haven't found this in any literature that we've had um, translated duly or anything, but uh, I don't know from like the different cooperators that you've worked with or others, I I just assume like where it is further south in China that they still just have the single generation and have not heard anything about that. But and there was one source that uh, was saying, uh, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember the source either, what publication uh, talking about, or if it might have been from the reports that we'd gotten, you know, that were not published about uh, SLF, you know, about, the, about eggs hatching, about them not having, uh, you know, a second generation, but eggs would hatch in the further southern areas where they didn't have a hard winter. But again, it was like really reduced hatch, but they were laying more eggs, but they kind of evened out because, or more egg masses, but it kind of evened out because fewer of those were actually hatching, you know, without the, the, the diapause. Yeah. I mean, I've been to where it's pretty hot in China and they do have SLF, but I've never heard of them having more, more generations, so. Great, um, let's see, we still have, oh good, we still have a bit more time. Uh, there was a question from Amanda um, that asked, how are winter temperatures incorporated into the survival and growth models that have been presented here? And I know that you uh, addressed some of those questions already, Stephanie, but if you mind verbalizing that uh, to the group, that'd be fantastic. Yes, of course. So the way that the winter temperatures appear most prominently in the model is that we develop per capita per day mortality rates due to those extreme temperatures, which were fitted. Um, Seba can tell you a little bit more about this than me, since he was the one who put the derived the actual forms of those functions, but they're fitted to data from survival studies from the lab. There was a question in the um in the Q&A too, Matt. Yeah, to yeah, let's pop over to Nadej. So Nadej, um, yeah, do you see that question in the Q&A? Yes, uh, very interesting question. So I think there are two uh, different things here. First, in terms of the data that was used. Uh, so uh, here we use the data that um, Seba talked about that was aggregated from the USDA, the states, iNaturalist, very, a lot of different sources. The important thing I think is that uh, we only use established populations, which means that we didn't use individuals that were found dead or single individuals because these cannot uh, be at the origin of a secondary spread. Uh, at, at the location where they jump to. So I think this was the first uh, one part of the question. Um, and the other part is that airports are at risk of germ dispersal. They are just not as much, much as risk uh, uh, as railroads. Um, so, and, and the, the other part of the answer is that the, the risk estimates also translate uh, um, a general pattern, like over all the gems that were found, what is the general pattern in their location? So it doesn't mean that some gems weren't associated to airports, it's just that in general, what is the risk for future jump? Uh, and, and it's not uh, as risky around airports than around railroads, for example. Great, so is that something that we should be thinking about, you think, Nadej? Because we do have sort of these, these 
interceptions of lantern flies, say in California or some other places, you know, is that something that we should be thinking about a little bit more strongly? I mean, certainly if you're finding a lot of dead lanternfly coming into your state, then that means that you're probably importing products with lanternfly on them. Um, how, how, how would we incorporate that, I guess? So I think there are a few different things here. Again, the first is survival that was mentioned by someone uh, this morning already. Um, if they can't survive the flight, then there won't, they won't like start a new population, but there are egg masses, then our egg masses are another concern. Uh, and if, if yeah, it, it's, a, it's a question of survival and number of individuals that are transferred. So I think there is something to do here. Um, we need to think a little bit more about that, but um, it's certainly a question of number too, yeah. Like yeah. our tra volume tra traffic, yeah, volume traffic and things like that, yeah, that need to be accounted for. Okay, cool. Um, any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat. Does anyone else see any more in the chat we want to talk about? Um, no, I, th I think uh, Nancy was also answering that one. There was another question about the the website that I think uh, Seba had up at the end, but I think they, I think she took care of that. Or they yeah, sorry. Did we... I put it in the, uh, in the, uh, the link is back in the answered question. So if that person okay. needs, she needs to just check in that answered question yep. section, because that's where it is. Oh, got it. Yeah. And then, yeah, there is the, the greater, um, the dashboard, which I'm going to put in to the chat as well. Um, uh, and that'll give you all the applications that are out there um, that, that, that we've done and, and everyone else who's been working on like fly and putting up applications has done. And so if you click on that link, that'll take you to a lot of different applications as well for those of you who don't know about it. And if Chris, you didn't have yours in there too, if you would, wouldn't mind putting that in the chat also, that'd be great. Greg, Actually, this, yeah. is, Greg this is Kelly Hoover. Somebody asked me to unmute. Do you know what that's about? Just if you wanted, if there was something you, you wanted to say or to make a point, Kelly, yes. Because I, I know if that, that was uh, more related back to the um, the hatch or not. I don't know. Or oh. the winter, the diapause. Yeah, I think tomorrow, Melody Keenis from the Forest Service is probably going to talk about her work looking at how um, lanternfly collected from different um, plant zones um, or who are maybe adapted to different temperatures react to very high or very low temperatures. Um, and also she may talk about the work she's done showing that she can get hatch um, at 15, I think it was 15 or maybe it was 18, I think it was 15, uh, at a, held at a constant temperature without ever having been chilled. But whether or not that impacts their fitness, I have no idea. Great, yeah, and certainly with these first principle models or these mathematical models um, that, that Stephanie talked about, thinking about whether there's plasticity or evolution in it, that really allows you then to um, anticipate some of these um, uh, scenarios like what we were showing. Um, sometimes it's a bit difficult when we just have data on the current spread to sort of forecast what might happen when it moves into a new climate. But if we have at least some experimental data such as the effect of chilling or whether or not diapause is actually necessary, those sorts of things, then we can explicitly put that into mathematical model and then project out as to what we might expect to see. Even if we haven't actually seen that in the field yet, it at least gives us some sort of way to assess risk. Um, and that's essentially what Stephanie's model is trying to do. Yeah, and Matt, I think you're right. There probably is plasticity, just like we've seen with um, Asian longhorn beetle, although hmm. there were issues when they didn't go through a chill diapause, mm. but the plasticity was there. Yeah, and if we look at sort of the other species in this family, a lot of them are tropical, don't go through diapause. So this is clearly a derived trait. It's not a conserved trait. So it might be much more likely for, for this trait to, um, um, uh, to be lost from populations that move into warmer um, uh, areas. At least that's just sort of thinking about the evolutionary history of this entire family. Great, I think that's it, Greg. Uh, we'll yeah. pop off. All right, thanks, Matt, and thanks to your group and to Chris also. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Yeah.